Okie dokie. Uh, good morning, all. Um, I am flying solo today at this BCS Policy Jam. I don't have Arnoldis with me um, to support, so things might seem and look slightly different. Um, but if you could bear with me, if there's any uh, anything going a bit slower than usual, um, that may be why. Um, I uh, yeah, closed captioning has been enabled on the uh, the Policy Jam. Um, everybody is coming in at the moment. Um, if you just give us two seconds while we uh, just assemble the panel. You can see everybody's faces, which is nice. Um, I don't seem to have the option to share my share my screen. So my lovely PowerPoint. So I'm um, not going to get used today, but that's fine. Um, the if you give me two seconds, I shall open this up, and we can see all the panelists across the top. We can also see the others. So James, um, everybody else, could everybody turn their cameras off because we are having some issues with the um, with the bandwidth at the moment, and then we can just focus on on the main panel. Um, I will continue to admit everybody because we're still getting people coming through. Okay, so welcome to um, today's BCS Policy Jam. This is the last of the uh, 2022 Policy Jams. Um, it has been uh, an interesting ride over the past um, the past year of doing these policy jams, we've covered some fantastically interesting areas of, of uh, public life, public policy and international relations when it relates to tech. Um, what is uh, really fantastic is the way that this has, I think, transformed the way that um, our organisation has been able to engage with members and engage with um, get, engage with experts in a different way. Um, and bringing members um, to a different uh, forum for engaging with each other on key th key issues. Um, and obviously, we in the policy team keep a keen eye on, um, on the movements of government and power in the UK. And we uh, this is one of our key areas in the way that we will look to engage with members and member expertise and bring those into the room. Um, and one of the things that we're really excited about is how um, our new chief executive, um, Rishik Palmer, um, is going to be using this forum to engage uh, more directly with, um, with, with members and with the sector. So every month um, next year, we will be doing these policy jams. And we're going to plan them out so that the dates are slightly more fixed. We know that they have been more uh, chaotic slightly over the past 12 months where we've been trying to respond to different um, to different uh, political events happening. But we'd like to think that maybe next year we won't have three prime ministers. Um, we, we don't know. Uh, but we'll try it. We will make sure that we are far more structured and um, participatory in that set in that sense. So. Um, what would be really good to do now is to pass first off to Rashik so that he can give a bit of an overview of where he thinks we are uh, as an organization in his third month now um, as, as CEO. Um, bring Rashik in. Thanks, Dan. And uh, yeah, great. Uh, time flies by. It's already into the third month. And uh, you know, where, where my head is right now, uh, we've now got very clear structure in place. We're doing lots of... Um, you know, organizational changes just to get the um, the teams focused and clear um, and and that will you'll see more about that early in the new year we're also we've got a strategy um session planned for the trustee board and the council early in january um and, and that's really going to focus on what's the bcs in 2030 look like and how do we start planning for that and put some structure in place so you, you'll see more about that come through in, in the future but what i'm seeing consistently at the helicopter level is all the conversations with um, colleagues, organizations, um, institutions, um, really flows around three very clear topics. The first one is, we know digitization has got a long way to go. 
and we're still part way through the process of digitization. And they're looking for us, the BCS, to provide some guidance and clarity on how will that digitization progress? How do I position myself for it? How do I how would I build the skills and capabilities I need to be able to be successful in that from a business perspective? And, and also how do I um bring young talent in, right? So the the the, the nurturing talent through this process into into creating the right digitization for for organizations and and and, and structures is, is is consistently a big topic the second big topic is sustainability and they see that as digitization progresses they do want to make a um, a step change in in their pr their plans towards net zero um and they want that net zero journey to um to, to really be something which provides the core purpose. Um, we had some conversations with the Fashion Trust recently, and, and they're, they're looking very, very closely at the supply chain and using data and digitization to give them the insights into the supply chain and knowing where they can focus their efforts to, again, decarbonize the supply chain. So this, this is a kind of common conversation we have. We also went up to see a company called IGS, which is um, Intelligent Growth Solutions, and they're building uh, vertical farming structure again 80 percent of their 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 organization is data scientists data engineers digitizers re trying to reimagine how they use that that digital capabilities to dramatically improve the um the yield and outcomes from um from the vertical farming structures they have really fascinating conversation really useful really, really insightful the third topic uh, is one of um connecting back with the staff and colleagues um you know di digitization as a, as a um, as a capability is is something which um can really put a barrier between individuals and and reduce the amount of social interaction people have so how do we how do we do that how to create some better meaningful relationships through that kind of digital technologies and and last week we were we were very honored and privileged to have uh, the Duke of Kent come to our offices and for any of you who who saw the the um uh, the pictures we'll see that um I, I met the Duke first through um, a telepresence robot uh, a part of what I'm trying to put in into the uh, organization is we want the BCS to be a role model for taking the the aspects of digitization of being net zero and of, of providing meaningful work um, and really be a role model for that and, and start to leverage technology and capability to so that uh, you know, we, we see now as being thought leaders in that space. So that, that's really where, where my head is right now. And um, we're seeing more and more of that, of that happening. Um, the Tab Trezent robot, by the way, is really good fun. It's, it's quite nice to drive around the office and suddenly meet somebody uh, in the office and, and they kind of get confused what's going on. But, but that, that's, that's a bit of fun. I'm sure we'll get past that to, to being much more productive. And you know, as, as you're probably all aware, I, I live in Leeds and getting to Swindon, especially this week with the rail strikes is quite tricky and the trailer presence robot becomes really useful as a way of not just sitting on a team's meeting but actually having a, a much more in-person conversation and 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 going and meeting colleagues in, in the office so that, that's where my head is down is that enough for now uh, yeah i just want to know how the duke responded to you in robot form uh, he was confused when he saw me in full form. I think uh, that's probably the best way of describing it. <laughs> he got used to me as a robot. He probably just sees me as a robot now, I suspect. Perfect. Fantastic. Th thanks, Rishi. Um, as we go through, um, Claire Penketh in our um, policy and PR team is going to keep an eye on the chat function. Hi, hey. Claire. Hi. <laughs> um, and so if people do have questions uh, for Rashik or any of the panel, please do direct them to uh, the chat function um, to try and keep it um, to keep us to time. Um, we do have some questions that have already been submitted so we can work through those. But um, as we uh, we want the, the, this question around um, can the UK be um silicon valley has so many um so many angles to it so many aspects and uh, it rests on quite a few assumptions that we want to unpick today um and we only have uh well we have uh, 49 minutes so um if we can go straight into this i think it'd be really really valuable if everybody on the panel um could introduce themselves um explain that where they're from what their background is and then um 
Uh, yeah, and then we can jump into the first question, uh, uh, which will be, um, can we? Uh, can the UK be a Silicon Valley? Uh, but if I go along the, the top of my screen, Vic, um, could you introduce yourself, please? Hello, everyone. I'm Vic Baines. I'm professor of IT at Gresham College, where my job is to demystify technology for the general public. Um, I have a background in law enforcement, cybercrime investigation, um, but also working in big tech in um, Facebook, as was. Um, and I have a particular interest in bridging the gap between tech and policy. Thanks, Vic. Uh, Roman, could we come to you next? Sure. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Roman Borisovic. I am the executive director of Sardina Systems. And as opposed to all of the panel uh, speakers, I'm not from the IT. I don't have IT background. I'm a career bank investment banker uh, in Wall Street and the City of London. And recently I joined one of my clients, a very promising firm that is uh, at the very edge of the tech. Uh, today we produce uh, cloud computing technology. We have uh, the most efficient cloud platform in the market that allows uh, our operators either to pack 50 to 70% workloads more on existing set of hardware, or obviously to save 50 to 70 percent of electricity if we're talking about a private uh, cloud uh, and uh, we are very busily promoting this technology thanks roman um jillian could we come to you hi uh yeah i'm jillian arnold and uh i'm currently the deputy president of the bcs and uh i'll become president of the institute in march um and uh, my background is in tech. So I spent 30 years working in technology, um, in shipping firms, in banks, and then uh, 20 years, the last 20 years of it in IBM. And, uh, and then I left um, about 10 years ago. So that gives me 40 years in the industry. I left 10 years ago and set up my own company and we do recruitment of women into technology roles. And because that doesn't work because of biases, then we train companies about how to manage their biases around, uh, around underrepresented groups in STEM. So um, we do that. Thank, thanks, Gillian. I think at some point we need to do a bit of a kind of reflective on your 40 years. And uh, yeah, maybe <laughs> we could spend an hour doing that. That'd be good. Um, OK, so we have um, Sam Sharps from the Tony Blair Institute coming later on uh, into this. Unfortunately, he's been called away to uh, a meeting with the chief exec. So when the chief exec calls, you've got to run, right? So um, so but he says he will try and get to us later on. I thought as his his perspective, coming from uh, working for Google in California for such a long time and now as director of tech and public policy at the Tony Blair Institute. Um, I thought it was worth us at least getting 15 minutes of his time uh, later on, if we can, then then kind of uh, then cancelling his uh, him being here. And sadly, Hema Parohit, um, our uh, healthcare, um, digital healthcare expert, is, is um, succumbed to uh, whatever lurgy she she was exhibiting last week because she came on a call with us to discuss this and she was not well then so she's now finally lost her voice so um but we can direct any questions to to Hema as well because I think the healthcare in, in the healthcare digital healthcare sector is going to be one of those areas where the UK has a um a big role to play okay so um we jump straight into the questions then i think if we go uh, in the in the direction that we went in before so rashik vic um roman jillian uh, jillian i think that was the the way we went um rashik could we come to you first about can and should the uk be the next silicon valley yes and yes okay fantastic would you like to expand a bit on that thing <laughs> <laughs> So, so firstly, um, you've got to understand the opportunity that's out there. The, um, we have done a huge amount of digitization of, of human life and uh, human activity. Um, and there's still a lot to do. The last OPEC report said 46% of jobs as we know them will go through significant change in the next 10 years. 
Um, and, and the phrase that I always use is be digital or be digitized, because, you know, this this wave of digitization is going to replace many aspects of um, of jobs that, that we have today. Um, and, and the opportunity is for us to be the, the digitizer of those uh, aspects of, of work. And as we do that, there's an opportunity for creating economic value. Um, can we do that? Yeah, we have skills and capabilities to do that. Um, do we have the organizations and businesses to do that? Well, we do have, right? So we could we could absolutely do that. And, and we've got 1.9 million IT professionals in the UK that could absolutely go do that work. Um, now, is that enough to do everything for the whole world? No, absolutely not. But can we do a significant portion, use that as a growth sector? Yes. The, the issue comes back to um, you know, funding. Yeah. Um, the whole level up agenda becomes quite a big part of this because a lot of the, that 1.9 million people don't sit inside the core of London. So we need to build a structure of funding and, and organizations to go do that. Um, but, but I would hope we would do that recognizing some of the, all, well, all, all the benefits of what Silicon Valley represents but also addressing a lot of the limitations that Silicon Valley has. So some of the limitations are things like um, being a more inclusive uh, culture and environment, um, addressing the broader needs of society, making sure that they're accessible, addressing some of the digital divide topics of that. So I think there's a there's a big opportunity there. And I think I think, yes, we could do that. We've got a lot of work to do, but yes. Great. Thank, thanks, Rashik. Um, Vic, can we come to you? So making potentially some similar points, I'm going to give the exact opposite answers and say no and no, and it's the wrong question. Um, so, and, I, and I think you would expect me to do that. So when politicians like Jeremy Hunt make announcements that, you know, the aspiration that will be the world's next Silicon Valley, the rhetoric, the message is far more important than the substance. And we see this time and again in tech policy. Things like the online safety bills claim that it's, it's going to be world beating legislation um, and that we're going to make the UK the safest place in the world to go online, which conceptually and logically, of course, is an absolute nonsense. The main thing is that somebody said it and it's, it's vote winning and it's point scoring. If you dig down into it, you try and answer it literally these questions. Um, Silicon Valley for me is somewhere where when you get off the plane, even the taxi driver, even the cab driver wants to pitch an app to you. And it's a very, very small concentration, you know, it's a, it's a huge concentration of money, of infrastructure, of talent in an incredibly small area. It's a little, so saying is the UK going to be the next Silicon Valley? Well, that's quite dispersed and disparate you're, pre you're probably better off saying you know is north wales going to be the next silicon valley in, in terms of in terms of geographical area um should it be the next silicon valley uh, certainly not on the same trajectory and and this taps in a, a little bit to to what what you were saying that uh, you know i would hope that we would have learned the lessons of move fast and break things I would hope that the mass layoffs that we're seeing from big tech companies, at least based in the US, would tell us that there's a journey, there's a particular trajectory that Silicon Valley companies have gone on so far. And to some extent, we're in the plateau of disillusionment. But what we do is we take Sil Silicon Valley, to use the Gartner hype cycle terminology, but, but what we do is we take that idea of Silicon Valley, we take that mythologizing of startups as unicorns, and we turn it into an obsession with exponential growth. That obsession with exponential growth has clearly fallen at something of a hurdle quite recently. There are things that the UK and particularly London can do to benefit from that. For example, thinking about all those poor people on LinkedIn, particularly those coming from um, South Asian countries um, who fear that they are now going to lose their, you know, they'll have their visa status taken away from them in the US because they've been laid off by Meta or by Twitter. You know, there are opportunities to draw that talent to London, but we've also lost some talent from the EU. And what we're seeing instead are hubs popping up in Poland, in Hamburg, in Paris, where there is a risk that 
all of that brain drain that we had when London was such a fantastic engineering hub is potentially um, going to cut us off from the EU market, mentioning the B word, um, but also mean that those cities are going to be chosen over London. So I think there are opportunities, but saying we're going to be the next Silicon Valley is, is a bit of a nonsense. Thanks, Vic. Um, Roman, I think this uh, when we had a chat, you had some really interesting uh, perspectives on kind of the, the, I suppose, the financial and regulatory infrastructure. So uh, would you be able to answer the question and maybe bring some of that into it as well? I tend to agree with Vic. Um, I'm, not, you know, I uh, don't know if we want to become a Silicon Valley. That's the main issue. You, we definitely can become, UK can definitely become the leader in the European, at least, technology and innovation. Uh, and there are all opportunities, all, well, again, Brexit is, is a huge impediment, but uh, uh, there, there are uh, all <clears throat> symptoms for that to, to take place um though you know silicon valley uh itself uh it's not a role model in my in my view and again i'm talking more here as an investment banker looking at the uh the the tremendous co concentration of capital and uh, what has it achieved it achieved uh a, a very volatile uh, environment exactly like what's happening now with the with the layoffs, but also with with stock markets, with valuations and everything. And you know, people in Silicon Valley they pride themselves on on that sort of uh, calculation on on those uh, multiples. I remember one uh, of, of the professionals uh, in in Silicon Valley telling me only half jokingly that valuations go down ten percent with that with each time zone away from California. Uh, indeed, that that would have been some of the case if you look at the at the valuation of tech companies over, over time, uh, and that 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 power that they achieved in in funding in capital uh, allocation, it's uh, uh, it, it, it creates uh, tremendous volatility. Uh, so that from that perspective, what you want is a steady. Uh, and uh, thought of, you know, thought through funding of technological initiatives, um, and and that uh, you know is something that we could uh, achieve in the UK. Um, from the uh, from the regulatory perspective, one thing I wanted to to uh, note is that you know funding is not really enough. Attracting uh, entities, uh, attracting investors, as, as what, what the UK has been doing so far is created a, um, a very impressive and very good, very efficient mechanism with EIS, basically, with EIS scheme uh, to fund uh, uh, tech and other um, startups and uh, small companies. I mean, this has been working very well, uh, except it excludes non UK. Um, non-UK investors, uh, but in itself, it's it's a fantastic scheme that has been uh, very well used for, over the last uh, many years. However, you know, instead of focusing on investors and and ability to attract capital, uh, the government should really focus on, uh, or should also focus on the propositions uh, for the companies, for the tech startups, and for the technology companies to stay. Uh, as opposed to leave as soon as they get the capital and go to uh, Frankfurt, Madrid, or other places, uh, whether it's Brexit-related or uh, just because they have better uh, tax uh, situation or, or other uh, incentives for tech companies. Take Luxembourg, for example. Uh, Luxembourg grants 80% uh, Discount on on uh, of um, of revenue taxes uh, to to technology companies in Luxembourg. Native Luxembourg technology is eighty percent percent tax free uh, in in perpetuity. It's not a five year. It's not a ten year. It's in perpetuity. Well, obviously, governments change that could be could change too. But for now, if you create technology in Luxembourg, then you'll be using it and uh, eighty percent tax free. 
I mean, probably that is uh, a bit of a uh, extravagant and uh, outrageous scheme for a small country that is trying to attract that talent. But somewhere there, you know, uh, is uh, is the right, the, the, right, the right direction is to look into that. Thanks, thanks, Roman. Um, Gillian, can we bring your thoughts in? Oh, so um, I'm with Roman. They're not a good role model. I mean, I'm sure we could, but are they a good role model? You know, if you look at the failure to pay tax by the big tech companies, a huge number of them are out of the Silicon Valley. So that suggests that there's an ethical um, position that they're taking, that it's okay to not pay tax in countries. And, and then you start to think about their ethics as a whole, and, and you see that you know they, they care less about the individual, or they care less about overall protection of groups, or they care less about whether technology is the right thing. And, and, and consequently, I think there are two perspectives, you know, the, the ethics and the way in which they behave culturally. And, and so really not a good role model for us. We, if we were to do it, and I'd like to think we'd be great at, at kind of bringing through technology, um, if we were to do it, we'd have to do it on a different on a different set of principles instead of and, and this is, you know, to to the the stuff that Jeremy Hunt was saying, he was talking about the um, the DMU and how, you know, we'd remove the ability to to um, or the, uh, remove the constraints of um, regulation. But actually. If we can't get the right culture, then we need the regulation. And, and so for me, it's it's an issue that we would that we would have a role model like the Silicon Valley companies, and that we would just blunder into that without considering the culture that we would expect of it and the regulation that we would want around it. And, and to Rashid's earlier point, you know, the professionalism that we expect of the individuals within the tax sector. So, yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's quite, um, yeah, it's emotive. And when you think about Silicon Valley, you, you have to think hard about what it is that makes you feel uncomfortable. And it's probably those things for me. Thanks, Gillian. Um, I think uh, some of that kind of cultural perception stuff is is what people are maybe talking about in the chat. And actually, the, the reason why it's important is how it's maybe directing the tone of our conversation towards maybe London and the southeast, actually, and some of the fact that the geographical um, issues around a term like Silicon Valley makes that a problem. And if Gillian, if we could come to you and you could maybe elaborate on the the kind of the potential for um, Silicon Valley being something that, you know, that aim of tech superpower and how we do that across the regions and nations of the UK, <laughs> rather than it being a case of focusing it specifically on London, because there's definitely a number of questions in the chat pointing to, you know, how we do that and if it's possible. Yeah, you know, so so when I when I go and talk to people, they always go, oh, yeah, we're in Leeds. And, you know, Leeds is the gaming capital of the country. And then you get to Reading and you go, do you know, Reading is the gaming capital of the country. And we all have to be realistic about what's happening within our region. And we have to be realistic about what's happening in other regions to understand, you know, that we could all be in this together. We could all be in this in a really positive way. Um, there are some issues. There are issues around skills, kind of deserts. So certain areas of the country lack the skills. And, and then you'll find the skills kind of clustered in another area because that's where the businesses have been. And then there are infrastructure issues. So, for example, and, and Rashid will know this because he's also up north. You know, if you if you get a job in Manchester, but you live in Leeds, 
in theory, it should be immediately possible for you to shift around the country, but it's actually physically impossible to get across the country. Now, I know things are changing because many of us are working remotely, but we're recruiting for a service delivery manager at the moment, and the company is saying definitely no work from home. So if that's the case, then that kind of infrastructure issue stops us from being as good as we can be in terms of being the next Silicon Valley or the next big IT superpower country. Thanks, Gillian. Um, Rashid, can we come back to you on that point? Because I know that it's been one of your key areas, the, the way that, you know, BCS and the wider organisation, you know, the government as well can be more um, proactive in the whole levelling up agenda. Yeah, I think every uh, local enterprise partnership or uh, local authority has been doing uh, the best they can to leverage the opportunities that digitisation provides. Um, and, and yeah, you'll go to Reading and Reading will say we're the best in digital and you go to Dundee and they say the best in digital. It, and, and what they're, they're referring to is digital with something. Um, and they, they all, they're, they're all bigging up what they have, which, which they have to do because they've got to try and make sure they're, they're playing on, a, um, on the agenda that matters. The, the trick here is um, that there was an agenda which we talked about as smart specialization, which says, look, don't try and do everything. Don't try and you know, um, do, do everything a little bit well, try and focus on one or two things and do them really well and, and start to to be uh, be best known for the, the few things that you're really, really good at. And, and I think as you start to think about the levelling up agenda, that's really what works. So you know, if you take what's happening, you know, Manchester doing a tremendous amount of work around media with the Media City stuff, you know, you take, take what's happening with Leeds around a lot of the healthcare work because of the, the work the NHS have done. You take a look at what's happening around Newcastle and some of the uh, the work with the car manufacturers. Each one of those has tremendous opportunity by bringing together, you know, a, an, an industry and expertise, a capability that matters. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to work on Smart City some time ago and, and, and the Smart City agenda said, you start with a very clear purpose for what that city is, right? And you, you start to build a brand and capability for that city. And then around that, you build the best infrastructure you need to make that efficient and effective. You then build a, a set of core businesses who become the anchor businesses that drive their capability and, and, and deliver on the brand. Use use the, um, the education, the, the research and, and the academic excellence to build the talent and research agenda so that you start to build all this out. So it's, 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 a, it's a very valuable structure when you think about that. And, and I think we need to take that kind of model and apply it into this notion of being the Silicon Valley. And, and I, th I think to, to, to Victoria's point, it, it is sensationalist and it, it is it is making a political statement. But the point is it's driving conversations like this, where we can then create the, the real plan that we can make a real difference. And I think for the BCS, this is something where we can absolutely make a difference. And we need to rise to that challenge and say, well, how do we do that? How do we, how do we, okay silicon valley is not the word, right word it's okay let's pile that to one side what is it we should be really driving around this digitization sustainability next generation work agenda and how do we be the role model and champion for, for driving that and really make that something that can make the uk seen as the role model that other, other people want to follow right Let, let's give it a term let's let's create some kind of nice smart phrase on it I don't, i'm not i'm not thinking straight on that right now but but we should be we should be creating something which is if you like the the phoenix from the ashes of 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 what comes from Silicon Valley to be something which is which we latch on to we which we want to be, sounds like a competition for members, Rashik. I think maybe we could do that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. L love love some ideas. Yeah, Vic, are you all right to come in now? Yeah, of course. So um, so I really like um the phrase that you use, Rashik, of um smart specialization because I think that's a much more realistic expectation. It's a much more realistic aspiration. Of course we can be one of the best in the world on health tech, on fintech, um, in gaming, et cetera. Um, but if we're talking about, you know, the, becoming a tech superpower, mm, that's probably unrealistic because we're a bit player in the techno-nationalist drama between the US and China. And actually, that would be a waste of the UK's resources to try and aspire to, to punch it at that weight. Um, but what we can absolutely do 
um, is specialise in those leading roles in certain sectors. I think the next tech superpower, whoever that might be, uh, will be whoever is in control of the largest amount of quantum facilities. That feels like it will be the next big tipping point for you know the next designated superpower and that might already be the US or China um but I I'd like to kind of pull a thread together if that's all right um in terms of inclusivity because one lesson that we absolutely must learn from Silicon Valley is that tech bro culture had its moment and is no longer appropriate and I think that tech bro culture does sometimes contribute to some of those unrealistic expectations from politicians. So I know, Dan, you've got a kind of simmering question around how do we close the understanding gap <laughs> between technologists and policymakers? One of the things that I do and that I'm really, really militant about is reminding politicians and policymakers that some of the expectations that they have of AI, quote unquote, um, and of what Silicon Valley can do and what it represents are unrealistic and they are just sensation. So there is a role for the BCS in absolutely bigging up what we can do as, as members and as fellows and as, as member organizations, but also bringing the political folks down to ground, ground level and keeping them accountable about some of those aspirations. Thanks, thanks, Vic. Um, Roman, are you, do you have any thoughts on this, especially when it comes, I mean, one of the questions that I would like to put to you, maybe from a financial perspective, is this the financial and regulatory infrastructure there to, to do some of this levelling up work? Is it, is, is it all, in, all in London or is there other possibilities for us to, to operate outside of the southeast? Um, before we go to, uh, to, the, uh, to the geographies, uh, I wanted to uh, continue on Vic's point that, and uh, uh, suggest something maybe not uh, uh, that common. Um, I think that we shouldn't really put up with the leadership of the uh, U.S. I mean, China is uh, really leading to the Chinese market, but the American uh, tech company is leading the the. Um, the globe at the, at the moment. I think we, we really need to rethink it and it will happen at some point because um, if you apply uh, the notion that um, data, information, computing power is the carbon of this, of this coming century, uh, then it is unthinkable to have up to 80% of the world's energy sector in, in the hands of one particular country, right? If this happened with oil or gas, you know, or th this this would have been acted upon by governments a long time ago. Right now, it is happening without people realizing that. So I think it's it's really up to each government to start m making decisions and making progress in that, in advancing towards the, uh, the, the, the cloud. If not, uh, well, it, you, you can dominate, but the dominance in 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 data, in, you know, applying data sovereignty, and this is something that has been definitely missing in the UK. And uh, our uh, colleagues, uh, our neighbors in Germany and France, are very much alert and uh, awakened to to that. To that. Uh, they are introducing, as we go, as we speak, you know, various regulatory regulatory measures. To curtail use of, uh, and it's not just about the uh, the cloud act. Uh, obviously, cloud act being a, uh, a a huge factor. The fact that U.S. companies, the U.S. government can can get data on uh, uh, in the hands of U.S. cloud companies, whether they're outside or inside the country, doesn't matter on which ser ser where servers are located. Of course, it's it's a problem, but <clears throat> it's also. Uh, when you start thinking about more of the, uh, from the geopolitical perspective, that's when the necessary, the need for reform, need for regulation comes into power. Um, and, uh, um, you know, from, from, from there on, I think it is uh, very, very natural that the, the UK will, uh, will, will, you know, probably prioritize certain areas and uh, grow uh, sustainable uh, technology in 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 one in, in one geography, uh, healthcare sector will be in in another. 
uh, cloud will be wherever the energy, the cheaper energy and close to, to, to the energy. Uh, I think that will come come around. I don't think you should create a specifically, you know, uh, designate specifically North Wales for, for healthcare or something like that. Thanks, Roman. Um, I think it, then if we can go into the next question, which Vic had already kind of touched on um, a little bit there around the kind of the, the gulf between um, the understanding of politician, uh, technologists and policy makers and politicians. But um, and this may be a slightly unfair question um, to the panel who, who maybe ha don't ha haven't had the time to do the reading on this, but there have been a few uh, reports coming out from different political parties on uh, on their plans for the next um, to be the next government. And one of the questions that has been put through is uh, to us is which political party understands the needs of our sector better. And I think this absolutely relates to this because you know we we are looking down the barrel of a general election in the next eighteen months, um, and uh, the enactment of any. Um, any technology policy will absolutely depend on the the nature of the next um, government. So, um, would anybody like to put their hand up as to who would like to go first on that one about which political party they think is probably better um, or has an understanding? I'll pick on someone. Gillian, yay, well done. I've got not very much to say um, because because this was like pitched in at the last minute, but to the question which political party, I think we're in a position where we can go and we can make the political parties both understand. And it's down to organizations like the Institute or indeed other organizations like us to go talk to the politicians and inform them and enable them to see more clearly what we can see across the sector. It, you know, we would be failing if we didn't go and talk to the politicians. And we should be talking to both sets because whilst, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of talk that says, oh, well, Labour's going to get in. That's not definitely going to happen. And so, you know, whilst you would, you would kind of bet that you should put most of your effort into educating them, actually everybody needs to know everybody at, a, at a, a leadership level needs to understand the future of tech for the next, I don't know, as far as we can see out anyway. If I could just build on that, Dan. So firstly, I think none of the parties understand tech. And I think others have said that. We'll, and, and you saw that just as I did when we were in the uh, the party conferences. You know, what, what you, you mentioned tech and the politicians kind of put their hand up. Oh, tech, I, don't, I need some technical person to help me here, please. Um, so, and that's not an acceptable position for, for any of them to take. Um, I'm, I'm sensationalizing and not quite as bad as that, but it's not far off. Um, but you've got to remember, we've been doing a huge amount to drive digital literacy. You know, digital literacy is a, a necessary skill that everybody needs to have to live in the society because of the nature of digitization, right? You, you can't go and buy an apple from the supermarket without some form of tech. You can't turn the water on, expect water to run without some form of tech. So, so that, that's everywhere. And, and so, you know, from a digital literacy perspective, we have a huge role to play. And we have been. We've, you know, you think, think about what's been happening with the, um, uh, the, the, the computing curriculum in the, the England schools, right? A number of you know, three quarters of a million, um, sorry, no, 340,000 kids have been through that training now. So for the future generations, they're certainly getting a lot more computing training than than as they're in in the past, um, and as a result of that, we will have we'll be addressing some of the future issues. At the same time, what we're doing through things like the digital divide, part of our influence agenda, is helping those that have been left behind. And th these are these are big topics because if you don't get these right, then you can do all the digitization you want, and you're not going to actually have people to to use it or be able to make good value of it. So, so from a political agenda, I think the role that the BCS has to play is um, to lead the charge in this and, and actually um, have a positive face that, yes, we can be whatever Silicon Valley is, you know, and wants to be in the future, 
that can be a UK ambition and, and we can help shape that agenda, drive that agenda and build the skills and capabilities and, and help support the businesses to be successful, to make it economically viable. And that's that's what I think we should be doing here. Thanks, Rashik. Um, Vic, did you want to come in on this? Yeah, I, I, so I think technophobia has become cool in politics, particularly with things like the introduction of the online safety bill and the digital markets unit. It's all about prohibition and control. And there are good reasons behind that. That's, it's well-intentioned. But in a sense, you know, what we've seen recently with the online safety bill are uh, the opposition parties coming out and saying, the Tories have watered it down. It's going to be a disaster. And then the Tories saying, we're going to be, you know, tough on the tech companies, et cetera. The, the underlying theme of all of that is that tech is scary and bad and it needs to be controlled. We're not getting that counter message of tech is brilliant. And bless him with the greatest, you know, while I'm not necessarily the greatest fan of Matt Hancock, you know, when, when he was in power, he launched his own app, didn't he? You can still follow him on his own app. There was at least someone who embraced digital in a way that we haven't seen for the last few months. So I would say we've still got individual champions of technology in different parties rather than one party being better than another. Thanks, Vic. Roman? Uh, yes. I need to start with uh, Rashid's point that neither uh, neither uh, or you know, none of the parties uh, understand technology. And building up from there, uh, you would then think, uh, which party is better positioned to drive the process? Which party is better positioned to create, uh, if not Silicon Valley, but uh, another uh, type of technological leadership in, in, in the country? And then you start looking at what what will it take. It will take regulation, government policies. It will take uh, some investment from the government. So basically, the opposite of uh, of the conservatives. So from that perspective, I think it's more of a labor policy. Uh, yeah, Gillian, you wanted to come back. Um, I, you know, for me, we we need to help both parties also because what happens currently is when one administration leaves the new administration will trash everything that the previous administration did so for example around 2008 9 there were brilliant business support units in each of the counties which were trashed when the coalition and then the Tory party came in. And then we've got these brilliant LEPs that have taken 10 to 12 years to build from scratch. And, and they do this, all the administrations do this with any kind of policy and any kind of piece of work. So if we were to trash lots of the good things, you know, so the investment that we get in technology and the sciences, then we'd have to start again and slow everything down. So if there was some way in which we could educate both parties, both major parties, that some continuance of the, of the valuable stuff is useful and stop competing, but actually collaborate, then that would be really useful. Thanks, Gillian. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's important. It's been noticed in the chat, and I think it is important that um, that when we're talking about political parties, we are talking about political parties outside of the Labour Conservative divide as well, and we're talking about the parties in power actually in in different parts of the UK. Um, and I think that there are obviously areas of devolution that are really important for us to understand um, as an organisation, uh, but for also the tech sector to understand. And I think conversely, what is really important is that the literacy gulf is not just one way where politicians don't understand us. It's actually the other way around as well, where technologists haven't got a clue in many ways about how to influence policy. So, you know, the amount of rooms that we sit in where um, people have the most amazing ideas, but 
there is no there, there is no literacy about how to affect the change and people are talking basically to to people that that aren't in power and it's a really difficult thing to to square so i think as we're moving forward as an organization bcs is an important nexus to try and solve that whereby technologists are upskilled to be able to deliver their inf information better and to and more effectively and the other way around um right so we've got nine minutes left um and we've had a number of questions i just wanted to uh, to ask claire claire have you noticed anything coming through um in the in the questions that you think we need to ask well it's it, you've been very lively and also thanks to the team for responding for the panel responding it's not left me with much to do you lucky chap <laughs> <laughs> so one of the questions um from Darren Roberts was uh, rather than rhetoric, what does a solution to this ambition look like in 2030, 2040 and beyond? Um, how do we as a country do investment um, learning and outcome? And he also asked later, which is a question which you then address, which um, what do we have at BCS uh, as our current lobbying channels? So that's one of the, the points. Another one, Dergish Gatonda, I'm sorry if I've mispronounced that. Um, we need to bring in the wider community, not just women in tech. Um, there needs to be elements of, of race, ethnicity, social mobility, neurodiversity to get young people uh, elevated and interested in tech. Um, and the, the other question that was addressed by you about, uh, by David Murray, about saying little alarm to hear both political parties. There was one that was a bit more technical for Norna Mitchell. Sustainability needs a joined up policy on scope three which has massive implications on how everyone records and shares data. And his clients haven't got a clue how to measure their supply chains, a lot of reinventing the wheel going on. So it's quite a lot to think of there. So I don't quite know which questions you'd like to pick from that lot. I mean, has anybody on the panel got anything that they wanted to, to flag? Um, I have an extra question I can ask, but if there's anything that anybody wanted to come back on and anything that Claire said or anything they've seen in the chat, please do. If that's a no, I'll just ask a question. Could I, well, yeah, I'll just jump in because in terms of answering the question of what can we do and what would it look like, I know that I've been quite negative on, on, this, on this discussion. So I, I immediately thought, well, yeah, what can we do then? So, so going back to the whole Silicon Valley idea, what I would love to see is an almost diagnostic review you know, someone tracking the ascent and plateau of, of big tech. And, and one of the things certainly that characterized that ascent was mergers and acquisitions, you know, by the competition um, and, and subsume the competition into your business model. And that kind of hasn't worked out in, in the way that the, the tech superpowers, so to speak, um, thought it would. So, you know, if we could look at those lessons learned, what does work well in terms of seed funding, in terms of VC, in terms of the rate of growth of a particular company? You know, I think about it particularly from a, an online safety perspective where tech companies come into the spotlight for there being problematic behaviours on their platforms, but actually, you know, they're two people and a dog in an office and they don't have a compliance team and they don't have a content moderation team. What does a, a good trajectory for a company look like? What are the lessons learned? Um, what are the pitfalls to avoid if you want to be able to create a vibrant, inclusive tech culture that also enjoys really healthy growth in a particular country? Um, and, you know, what's the good practice? What are those elements of success? I'm sure there's been loads of work done on that, but it would be lovely to think about doing that from a UK centric perspective. Can I come back on that, Victoria? I don't know if you're aware of the Digit Lab, where I'm a Digit Fellow, and that focuses on exactly that set of topics. So it's a research agenda funded by UKRI, um, looking to gather best practices around digitization, um, understanding how large established organizations do that digitization. So, yeah, absolutely. And there's a ton of material. There's, there's work done by the Horizon Project where Catherine and the team did some work. There, there's, there's a number of pockets that, that have, um, and, and there's a lot of depth of knowledge around this that we can share. Th thanks. Um, Gillian, I know you've messaged to say that you've got, um, you've got a, is it a plan? Or you've got an idea that's going to fix it all? 
<laughs> no, no, just a couple of points. So one of the objectives of the Digital Markets Unit is about um, gathering data and understanding. And so that might actually fit perfectly with that. But, but my experience of creating software, which I did for a little while after I left, left IBM, and we used the resources of the UKRI at the time, um, was that they were great at, at funding that first part and guiding us on the first part of the process. But when it came to the go to market bit, it, it, they just dropped us. And, and if it's still like that now, then, then you know, we are going to be challenged to get anyone over that. Well, how do I get this thing out to market? Um, so so there, there should be some work on that, perhaps. Thanks, Gillian. Um, Roman, have you got any final points with our four minutes left? Oh. Looking at the uh, future, uh, 2030, 40, um, my, I, I have very simple uh, suggestions. I think it, very practical and simple. Um, there's, there should be more government involvement. We should have more uh, Br British technology promoted and uh, ring fence. You know, the government should be using as as in other countries, as in Germany, they should be using British IT. Um, they should be using. British uh, clouds, British mm, everything, and starting with that, promoting. Uh, the other thing would be uh, we need more seed funding. We need more of a, of uh, a lower layer funding, and the government should play an active role in uh, providing solutions in, 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 in this segment. That's all for me. Thank, thanks, Roman. Um, we've got three minutes left. I don't know if anybody's got any kind of final um, thoughts um, on this, and then we'll we will close it off. But I am I'm, I'm minded to to go towards um, Rashik and give him the opportunity as the the chief exec. But if anybody's got any thoughts, um, please do let me know. Rashik, go for it. Um, so, look from my perspective whether we call it Silicon Valley, Silicon Roundabout, Silicon Alley, Silicon Street, Silicon whatever, um, the, the opportunity here is for the BCS to step up. Right? Um, the phrase I often use is be digital or be digitized. And and as as we start to drive the next wave of digitization, um, we as professionals should step up and, and demonstrate what that really means and use that professionalism to to drive the kind of societal and business impact that we want to, to, to really make IT good for society. And we can absolutely do that and do that in a way where we showcase the, the positive stories of how um, we, we can really make um, the society much better through digitization. And I think we should we should leverage the opportunity that, that the government's made around this Silicon Valley ambition uh, and build that plan and, and, uh, and drive it forward. So I, I see it as a, as a great opportunity for us and we should, we should uh, uh, leverage it as much as we can and we need all your help so so any ideas please do come back to us that, thanks Rashik. i think that's a, the perfect call to action to to finish on um jillian's putting in the chat there darren are you volunteering i think darren's definitely volunteering we'll we'll chat on uh, linkedin and get it sorted um but yeah thank you everybody um this is the final uh, policy jam of 2022 uh, and quite soon we'll all start uh, dropping off for festive breaks. So hopefully everybody has a really uh, good festive break and, and really enjoys uh, the time that they've got off. I know I'm very excited to be finishing on Friday. I love my job, but I want to spend some time with my nephews and nieces. So that'll be good. Anyway, uh, thanks all to, to the panelists for your amazing contributions um, and to everybody for turning up. It's really well attended and it shows that this is, this is a kind of conversation that we desperately need to have more of. So we will look to next year to flesh this out more. Uh, but thank you very much, everybody. And we'll see you in 2023.